I'm going to um, hand it over to to Dr. Sam Wartman. Sam is relatively new to us, about, what, three years, Sam? Yep, right about three years. And glad to have him here at the university. Sam does a lot of work uh, in urban agricultural uh, growing uh, types of systems, and we were really happy to be able to get him on here today. So, Sam, that's about the, all the introductions I'm going to do. Um, go ahead, and, and you're good to go. Sounds good. Thanks, Kyle. So uh, Kyle asked me to do a, a webinar today on hydroponic systems, and we're going to kind of do a pretty extreme crash course. Um, I'm going to cover a wide range of topics here, and just know that uh, any one of these topics could be turned into kind of a full day workshop. Um, and I do believe that um, University of Illinois Extension in the last couple of years has been offering workshops on hydroponics, and will probably continue to offer some of those in the coming years and so keep an eye out for those and if this anything in this presentation piques your interest um, we'll hopefully be able to get you some more resources for some of those upcoming workshops all right so overview of uh, what I'll cover in today's webinar uh, first I'll just kind of a, an overview of, of hydroponic food production get everybody on the same page then we'll uh, do our best to get into some of the specifics on nutrient management um, we'll talk about different types of growing media that can be used uh, in hydroponic systems. Um, and then we'll talk about those uh, variety of different systems that are going to be appropriate for different types of crops. And, and then I'll finish up by talking about some of the research uh, that we've been doing um, here on campus into hydroponic food production. So there's been a lot of renewed interest in hydroponic um, food production here in recent years. Um, where I've seen it most is with regards to urban agriculture. There's been a lot of interest in cities like Chicago, small startup companies, folks wanting to grow hydroponically in, uh, for example, abandoned warehouses um, or high tunnel greenhouses. But um, this isn't uh, necessarily a real new concept. Um, in commercial greenhouse production, hydroponics is fairly common. Uh, if you go to places in Canada, California, uh, or or Holland, you can find thousands of acres of greenhouse production where they're using hydroponic systems, um, primarily for things like growing tomatoes or peppers or, or cucumbers. Um, so it's uh, estimated that there's close to 100,000 acres of hydroponic greenhouse production globally, um, and it's, that number is probably a little bit of an underestimate. So this is a, a big business. But there's been a lot of rec uh, recent interest um, in adapting some of these systems for uh, small farmers. And where I've seen that primarily is in urban areas. Uh, the, incentive, a the incentive for using hydroponic systems uh, in an urban environment is that you're often limited. The amount of um, uncontaminated arable land that you have in a city might be limited, but you may have... Uh, for example, plenty of rooftop space like Gotham Greens in New York takes advantage of, or you may have abandoned warehouse space like Urban Till in Chicago takes advantage of, uh, or you may have um, paved vacant lots um, that you could um, use in a place like Tampa Bay um, as Urban Oasis does. So other reasons that you might consider hydroponic food production um, instead of soil-based production in addition to kind of the urban to rural type of um, scenario um, is that hydroponics helps us to, in some cases, avoid certain pest and disease pressure that uh, we're maybe facing in a soil. Um, there's evidence that um, certain cultivars of um, fruit and vegetable crops yield, uh, have higher yields in hydroponic systems and greenhouse environments than they would in a field environment. There's also interest in reducing overall um, uh, resource use efficiency of crops, and so there's some evidence to suggest that we can do that in a hydroponic greenhouse environment. And then ultimately we're looking to increase yield. So some studies have suggested that over the um, similar period of time that we can get four to ten times um, relative yields in a in a greenhouse compared to a field environment. But um, those the evidence in that uh, regard is a little bit lacking and, and inconsistent. So um, some one study suggested that the yield increase is only about 20% uh, when you compare um, just soil versus soilless production in a greenhouse. So a lot of the yield increase that's typically reported for hydroponics is simply because of that controlled environment that you have with the greenhouse compared to the field environment. So um, growing in the soilless media may only attribute to about 20% of that yield increase. Okay, so 
Um, I'll be the first to tell you from uh, a couple years of playing around with these hydroponic systems that hydroponic food production is not always easy. Um, the comparison I like to use is that I grow uh, in my backyard. I've got uh, a raised bed vegetable garden that's compost-based, so I've got um, filled those raised beds with uh, a compost-based media. I typically will put my transplants in there in the in the spring. I'll maybe, uh, if, it's, if we get a couple weeks without a good rain, I'll go out and water those a few times a summer. But, and maybe trellis, um, if I've got a big tomato variety, I'll, I'll uh, cage those. But I could probably get away with maybe five or six trips to my garden during the summer, and I'm, I know I'm going to have some, um, some tomatoes and peppers out there to harvest at the end of the year. Hydroponics, uh, I'll say that you maybe in some cases need to make five or six trips to your system per day, um, depending on uh, what you're doing um, or how your system has been adapted. So these are intensively managed systems, um, so that's that's one uh, challenge of dealing with these systems. It's not uh, like soil where sometimes you can just uh, set it and forget it. Um, there is a higher initial capital cost, so oftentimes um, soil and compost to grow things can be inexpensive, but um, buying some of these prefabricated systems for hydroponics can be expensive, uh, and then running them can be energetically, energetically expensive, pumping water constantly through a system um, can be expensive, and if you're in a greenhouse or a warehouse environment, the uh, energy to light that environment can uh, become expensive. Um, there are certain pathogens, uh, specifically the Pythium species, Phytophthora and Fusarium, um, those things that typically in a field we have problems with when you're in a, a poorly drained soil uh, early in the spring when you get heavy rains and, and our roots are kind of hanging out in water for a long time. Those same diseases uh, are problematic in, in hydroponics, especially in situations where you don't have enough oxygen um, in that um, in your water solution. And when you get a, a, an outbreak of a disease like that, uh, the problem with hydroponics is that when you've got recirculating water and nutrient solution, you can spread a disease like that rapidly, um, and you can lose a crop pretty quickly if it's not being intensively managed. Okay, so that's, uh, I guess, where I'll stop with the overview. Um, I'll now talk about uh, how we manage nutrients in these systems. So this is a, just a quick overview, um, a comparison of, of how we manage soil-based uh, culture versus hydroponics. Um, this is taken from uh, Howard Resch's book, um, what is the name of that book? I've got it here somewhere on my desk, Hydroponic Food Production. Um, so that the most recent uh, edition is 2012 by Howard Resch. It's a great resource if you're serious about um, experimenting or trying with uh, trying hydroponic food production. Uh, that's definitely a must-have resource um, for the the beginning grower. Um, and that's where they pulled this table from. But so some key differences here: sterilization. Um, is essential uh, between cropping cycles. So you can think of sterilization in hydroponics as your only option for crop rotation. Um, so that's when you're growing continuously in the same system, uh, we can't rotate out of that. So we need to be very thorough about sanitizing systems in between um, cropping cycles. Plant nutrition uh, is definitely different between the two, um, and I'll get into that more in a second here. Plant spacing is an advantage of hydroponics. We're only limited by light uh, because we can control how much water and the nutrients we pump to the roots of our plants, and so we can place those, uh, we can space those plants more densely, uh, which may contribute to higher yields compared to the field environment. Uh, obviously, we don't have weeds in hydroponics. Um, soil diseases and pests are not a problem. Um, in uh, an efficient hydroponic system, we're only losing water to transpiration. We don't uh, have any evaporative loss um, in most systems anyway. And that's an advantage over soil-based systems where we do lose a fair amount of um, water to uh, evaporation. Um, fertilizers will be managed differently. <clears throat> and um, transplanting. We typically don't need to worry about uh, transplant shock in a hydroponic system. Okay, so I mentioned I'd come back to this uh, concept of, of how nutrient management is different in hydroponics versus soil. Um, so I mentioned that planting in my garden is relatively easy because I've, I'm getting a lot of mineralization of nutrients from the organic matter uh, from that compost in my raised beds. 
and uh, that typically uh, in most years will provide a sufficient amount of nutrients for most of my crops. Um, compare that with hydroponics. Can you guys see that pointer if I click and hold that? Can you see this if I click and drag yep. this? Yep. Okay, well, we'll use that as my pointer then. Okay, so um, so this is the only, if you think about a soil system, you've got organic matter, plus we can add inorganic um, We've got inorganic components, just the, the soil minerals, and then we can decompose those soil minerals, but we can also add fertilizer, whereas in soil you get these organic components, decompose minerals into that soil solution, which then becomes in contact with plant roots. In hydroponics, we basically eliminate all of this uh, organic matter mineralization, and so we completely rely upon fertilizers added to that soil solution to support plants. So a huge fundamental difference. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we often take for granted in soil-based systems. When we think about a fertility program for most of our field crops, uh, we often don't have to worry too much, depending on which region you're located in, but we don't have to worry a whole lot about some of our micronutrients, or sometimes we don't even worry too much about our secondary nutrients, things like sulfur, for example. We're maybe just concerned about those uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, maybe calcium and magnesium a little bit with your fruiting crops. Um, but... In a hydroponic system, we, we need to account for all of these nutrients, especially um, those micronutrients that we typically might not think of in a soil-based system. We also have to be uh, very conscious of the um, pH of our nutrient solution, and we typically are going to, depending on the crop, we're going to manage it between about 5.5 and, and 6.5 and uh, to maximize uptake um, efficiency of all of our different essential nutrients. Uh, whereas in a soil-based system, we might be shooting more for about the six and a half range. Uh, we can still run systems pretty efficiently around that five and a half to six range in hydroponics. So the optimum pH is a little bit different between the systems. And hydroponics are going to be more susceptible to swings in pH because we don't get any of that buffering capacity uh, that we enjoy in soil-based systems. So because... Um, we're so dependent on fertilizer inputs and we don't have any of that buffering capacity from soil, uh, it's not uncommon to uh, see nutrient deficiencies develop pretty quickly in hydroponic systems. Um, but if uh, spotted and uh, quickly, we can remedy those um, just by adjusting that nutrient solution, either the pH or maybe increasing or decreasing the amount of nutrients in the overall solution. And so visual diagnostics become pretty important. So familiarizing yourself with these uh, common deficiency symptoms of <laughs> things like iron, calcium, um, and your macronutrients is going to be really important to quickly um, fix those, those problems. I can say with fruiting crops, um, we've had a lot of uh, trouble keeping uh, kind of fine-tuning calcium levels to get high-quality fruit production and things like tomatoes and most recently in strawberries. Um, so that is a very important element when growing fruiting crops and hydroponics that you'll you'll probably have to play around with and, and fine-tune for individual uh, individual crops. So towards um, this nutrient management um, goal, this um, one app that we use uh, pretty regularly in our lab is the Yara Check It app. So this is a free app that, uh, if you're a smartphone user, that you can get uh, through either uh, Android or the um, the Apple Store, um, and it's it's pretty handy. It's basically there's nothing too fancy about the app. It's basically a photo database, and so when you enter the app, you'll see uh, a, a page with a variety of different um, horticultural crops that you might grow in uh, a hydroponic system. And if you click on one of those individual crops, uh, a further library opens up with uh, about 50 images, for depending on the crop. And you'll find pictures of each um, of these potential nutrient deficiencies. And if you click on that, even, you'll then get a written description of what types of uh, symptoms to look for, and even some suggestions for how to remedy those p uh, potential deficiencies. So, this, um, as I mentioned, being able to quickly ID those problems in hydroponics is very important. So having a tool like the Yara Check It app um, is, is very useful and something we use on a regular basis when we're growing hydroponically. So in most, uh, you know, well over 95% of hydroponic systems, the nutrients are supplied by inorganic salts. 
Uh, so we do need to make sure that all of those fertilizers are water soluble and greenhouse grade. Uh, we don't want them clogging up our irrigation lines. And um, our, we will use uh, a complete nutrient solution. Uh, we use a Jax hydroponic solution, 51226 NPK. Then we're also supplementing with calcium nitrate. Um, uh, that provides some additional nitrogen because we only have 5% in that complete solution, but that's also how we get our calcium uh, into the solution, which I mentioned is uh, essential for those fruiting crops. And uh, larger scale commercial growers will actually probably end up weighing and mixing individual compounds and making specific nutrient formulations for specific crops, but uh, if you're just starting out and growing uh, maybe a diversity of different crops, a more general solution like this is a good place to start and you can tweak from there. Inevitably, um, you'll, you'll see different types of deficiencies develop and you'll have to adjust your solution accordingly. Um, some of your metals like iron, manganese, and zinc uh, need to be added in a chelated form uh, to keep those metals from precipitating out of solution. I get a lot of questions about uh, the potential for organic hydroponic production. And uh, a lot of um, hydroponic growers do claim to be organic, at least for a while until um, organic certifiers crack down on them, because while many, uh, a large portion of hydroponic growers, at least uh, the ones that I've worked with in uh, places like Chicago, they are pesticide free. Um, so they're not using, they're using IPM um, beneficial insects, for example, to control their pests, and they're not using um, fungicides. Um, they're not using pesticides or insecticides, rather. And so in their minds, that's an organic product, but that doesn't fall underneath the USDA's definition of certified organic, which requires um, that synthetic, or pro rather prohibits the use of synthetic fertilizers. And uh, as I mentioned, those inorganic synthetic fertilizers, uh, water-soluble fertilizers are essential and most commonly used for hydroponic production. But there has been the development of some new products and a lot of recent interest because there are those folks that maybe want to start an urban farm um, and, um, and use, be able to certify themselves as organic to take advantage of that premium market. And in that case, there are f a few options, but they are definitely limited. Um, there are some liquid organic nutrients available. Um, this is one product that's, that we have worked with a little bit. Um, it's called Nature's Nectar, and you can get nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and then you can get a micronutrient blend. Um, one problem is that um, there is some organic matter, um, that some dissolved organic matter in these solutions, and so that can contribute to uh, and promote microbial activity, which is something that we generally want to avoid in hydroponic systems. These are not completely sterile systems. Um, there is microbial activity um, in in hydroponic systems, but um, we don't want a lot of dissolved organic matter uh, because that can create um, that can reduce overall oxygen levels in the water, which will contribute to some of those root diseases like Phytophthora and Pythium. Um, and so that's a problem with these solutions. A lot of them uh, are very thick, so you could even we've even tried using uh, fish emulsion um, as a nutrient solution or a nutrient source for organic hydroponic production, but you run into problems um, with clogging of irrigation lines and equipment, so you're frequently cleaning these, um, and so it is more burdensome that way. Obviously, if you've ever worked with fish emulsion, it uh, does have a pretty uh, significant odor, and so it's not real pleasant, especially you might be um, in a um, urban area where you're selling direct to customers, or you might have a U-Pick operation, and that can be a real problem. And then the last issue is, is cost, and these are, um, most of the organic fertilizers that we've sourced have been prohibitively expensive compared to those um, mineral uh, organic nutrients that are available. Um, and that's not necessarily the case when growing uh, organically in a soil-based system. Oftentimes your fertilizers, you're maybe saving money on fertilizer, you're using green manures or using on-farm compost that is essentially free to the farmer. Um, and so this is a, a big difference uh, conceptually between organic hydroponics and a soil-based system. Um, looks like I'll try and field these questions as I see them come in. Looks like um, Donna is asking, 
Yes, the basis of organic is to work with the soil. Um, hard to believe that if, even if the inputs are are organic, the system concept uh, is the system concept organic. Um, and that's a good point, Donna. That has been a, a big problem with um, folks that have tried to get these systems certified, is there's kind of a philosophical block um, between uh, the National Organic Program standards and um, the concept of hydroponics and removing soil from the equation. Um, but that doesn't mean that people uh, haven't been trying to find ways to, to get these systems certified. So um, that's kind of a work in progress. I know that there, I'm going to mention briefly later in the presentation, aquaponics. And I know that there are some aquaponic, um, there are a couple of certified organic aquaponic operations, but I, I don't know of any certified organic straight hydroponic um, operations. So it's kind of still an elusive uh, goal, probably for the reasons that you mentioned. Um, and then we've got another question about what about a compost tea solution? That there are products out there, um, compost teas that have been offered as um, organic fertilizers. The other problem that you run into with all of these is you'll see like this nitrogen is 500. The just like with other organic nutrients, the um, the um, the fertilizer um, rating is often much lower than you would find with um, those mineral nutrients. And so, um, again, because oftentimes those organic nutrients need to be mineralized, and you're not going to get as much mineralization in a hydroponic system in the absence of soil microbes. So it is um, kind of a, an, an interesting <laughs> system to work with, to say the least. But one option that you can do that I've um, talked with folks about is the idea of charging your media, so kind of doing a hybrid hydroponic and soil-based system, taking your hydroponic um, media and mixing that with, say, compost, or I've even um, heard some people mixing in a little bit of soil, um, and or something like vermicompost, or even just solid organic fertilizers, fish meals, or uh, soybean meals. And and then basically you're just going to more of a drip irrigation system, and then you're getting a slow release of those um, those organic fertilizers that way. So we're actually I'll talk more about the research um, side towards the end of the presentation, but we're actually um, looking at um, some of these questions um, in strawberry production this summer. So how do we set up these nutrient um, management systems? We typically are going to use um, injectors. And this is, I guess, a setup more for a an open loop system, um, so not a recirculating system. Um, these stock solutions are nice because you can prepare the solution and um, not have to change it out for uh, several weeks. and one term that you want to become familiar with is electrical conductivity, or EC. Uh, we use that as a generic measure of nutrient strength because this gives us an idea of the total concentration of salts in a nutrient solution. Um, and we're also going to be clo closely monitoring pH, again, to keep it between that 5.5 to 6.5 range. So again, about a two-week, two to three-week lifespan on some of these stock nutrient solutions, depending on crop stage. Um, after that time, if you're in a, a closed loop system, your elements will start to your nutrient elements will start to become somewhat dilute and limited into the plant. So you'll either need to supplement with more nutrients, or you'll need to change out um, the the nutrient solution altogether. During that two to three week period, you're also you'll also need to be adding more water to that um, solution. Uh, because if you're recirculating over time, those evapotranspiration rates, primarily transpiration, is going to be greater than overall nutrient uptake. So what you'll find is that the overall solution volume will decrease, but those nutrient levels uh, will kind of increase relative to the amount of water. Um, and so you'll start to get uh, a much higher relative nutrient strength. That EC will go up. So you want to make sure to replace water that's lost on a daily basis to that transpiration. And we, we can monitor that with um, by checking on that EC and pH on a regular basis. Overall water quality that you start with is important. Two main things that you want to keep an eye out for, and if you do a water test in your area, is you want to make sure that your, um, your salt levels are less than 50 parts per million, that sodium chloride. And you also want to check on hardness of the water, um, because hard water increases pH and is going to make things like iron less available. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're you're starting with a high quality water source. 
All right, so now let's take a look at uh, some of the different growing media that is commonly used in hydroponics. Um, it's not essential to use soilless media. There are situations where we can just use um, we can use just water culture, and we don't necessarily need to put the roots into some type of media. But um, the popular media that folks like to use are rock wool, um, and I would say rock wool is um, currently the industry standard for growing things like tomatoes in hydroponic greenhouse production. Um, perlite is also common, vermiculite, cocoa is becoming increasingly popular, and hydrogen and hydrocorn is, is this stuff in the, the bottom right corner here. So when we look at different types of media, what we're and we're comparing those types, and we're looking for properties that are right for your particular operation, um, you want to consider the particle size, shape, and porosity um, of the media because that's going to influence water retention. So if you have smaller particles, that is going to increase surface area. You're going to get more water retention. If you've got uh, irregularly shaped particles, that's also going to create more surface area and increase water retention. Uh, if you've got a porous material, that's also going to provide increased surface area. Um, and so water retention can be important, especially if you're going to more of a, an open loop drip irrigation type system. In that case, um, then preserving that, conserving that moisture in between watering events becomes important. Um, but in a lot of cases, we're also looking for sufficient drainage. Um, so larger, um, larger size media can be beneficial in those situations. So I mentioned rock wool is kind of the industry standard. Rock wool is made, um, it's actually uh, often called stone wool. It's made from basalt, which is just lava rock that's heated up to really hot temperatures uh, and, and then expands. And then they put it into um, these different shapes for uh, horticultural production. Has very high pore space, 95%, uh, great water holding capacity. Um, it will retain moisture uh, for a long time after each watering event does not have buffering capacity, so again, that's a big difference uh, from soil-based systems. It can be used uh, in a variety of phases of production and different crops, so we can use it all the way from the transplant stage. You can put your seeds right in there and get things, um, get those seedlings uh, germinated, and then you can take it all the way to um, harvest by putting, um, it, basically putting your larger, or excuse me, your, your small transplant plugs into larger cubes and eventually into rock wool slabs, uh, which can span the length of a greenhouse bay. So a lot of this um, production, this uh, was uh, invented uh, originally by a company in the Netherlands, so they still do a lot of this type of production in the Netherlands. Um, and the big drawback, which limited their growth in recent years, is that it's not uh, a biodegradable um, or renewable um, media, and so um, Grodan, this uh, company, has tried to offer recycling programs to try and improve kind of the environmental profile of this product, but um, they've been losing some market share to uh, cocoa coir recently, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Perlite, which is uh, well known to many people as just a common component of greenhouse potting mixtures because it provides good porosity and drainage in um, Greenhouse potting mixtures is also can be used by itself as a, a hydroponic media. And just like um, rock wool, it is um, mined. It's a silica mineral heated up to extreme high temperatures, and then it expands. Um, you can see that kind of progression of perlite in this picture in the top right. Um, it can hold uh, up to four times its weight in water, also like rock wool it has no buffering capacity or cation exchange capacity um, and it, it provides some good aeration so this is not an uncommon situation where you'll see a, an open loop drip irrigation system with tomatoes um, in a greenhouse pot or more commonly a dutch bucket or beto bucket which i'll i'll talk about here shortly vermiculite is not as commonly used by itself in hydroponic uh, systems it may be combined with perlite um, or cocoa coir uh, in, a, in a mixture for media, but by itself it's uh, not necessarily the best option for, for growing hydroponically. But it is uh, derived in the same way. It's a superheated mineral that expands, 
um, very lightweight. That's a that's kind of a key for all of these different types of media is that they're lightweight. Uh, so folks that, uh, as I mentioned, some of the growers that are interested in more of the organic philosophy, they want to include a lot of soil and compost in some of their media, uh, which is maybe okay depending on your situation. But a lot of these hydroponic growers are growing in uh, greenhouses. They maybe are growing in vertical stacks. They may be, in the case of Gotham Greens, they're growing on the tops of, um, of buildings. And so the overall weight of your operation on a square foot basis becomes very important. So having lightweight media uh, is something to consider. Okay, so coco coir is uh, becoming quite popular, and it's really just made from the um, ground-up coconut palm husks. And... Uh, the fibers, uh, which is called the coir, is uh, what provides porosity and aeration. And then the pith, which is part of that fiber, also is commonly used um, as a, um, a seedling uh, starting mix. It's much finer. But the cocoa chips is how you'll commonly see it marketed. Um, that is what can be used as a sole uh, media for production. So great water holding capacity. It's got a great surface area, um, 20 to 40% air capacity at saturation, so you don't have to worry about um, oxygen levels in that root zone even when you're at saturation. Uh, it does have, this is one unique thing about coco coir compared to those other media, it does have a high cation exchange capacity because this is a plant material. This is made up of cellulose and lignin, um, which has negative charge, and so you're going to get some cation exchange capacity. Um, another unique thing is that the roots will actually grow through the substrate, and you'll, this is how you'll find it if you go to a retail um, outlet. You'll see it in these compressed bricks, and then you'll actually have to submerge that in water, and it'll actually expand out. You'll get a lot more of that cocoa. It'll start to look like this as you expand it out. And I mentioned that this is gaining market share relative to rock wool because um, many folks like that it's a renewable source. If you've got some type of integrated soil and hydroponic um, uh, operation, a diversified system, you could actually maybe use uh, the, the spent cocoa coir from your hydroponic system and incorporate it into your soil in the field as an organic amendment. Um, the other potentially nice thing about coco coir is there's a lot of interest among uh, growers in using beneficial microbes. For example, uh, trichoderma species of, of fungi could be used to uh, control different uh, soil or uh, root pathogens. So things like uh, pythium can be controlled with those beneficial fungi. And those fungi need some type of substrate uh, to reprodu reproduce and grow. And coco coir may provide that organic substrate that they need uh, in solution. Uh, another material is hydrocorn. Uh, it used to be called hydrotin, and now it seems to be marketed as hydrocorn. Um, this is just a, a basically a clay pebble. Um, it's also inert, like your um, perlite and um, and your other uh, vermiculites. Um, does provide some plant stability, although it's much coarser. Um, the overall particle size is much coarser than things like perlite and vermiculite. Um, it does have a fairly inconsistent um, shape size, even though they're all kind of in this pebble form. There is some porosity that goes through indiv individual pebbles. So that's going to help a little bit with moisture retention, although if this is not really the media that you would want to pick if you're looking for good moisture retention. You want to go uh, more with rock wool or, or perlite in those situations. And I mentioned that uh, the way that we rotate, uh, quote-unquote, rotate out of crops in hydroponics is that we just have to sterilize uh, these systems um, because uh, it would not be economically feasible to, you know, fallow a hydroponic system, for example. We, these are very intensive systems, and we need to keep producing um, crops on a continuous basis. And so um, to do that uh, and avoid the buildup of, of different uh, diseases, we have to make sure to... Um, sterilize both the system and in some cases you can uh, sterilize the media. Um, so you could use a steam-based system. Um, there are some chemical options, chemical fumigation options, um, and but depending on the media that you're using and the cost, um, simply replacing that media may be more co cost-effective than trying to sterilize. Okay, so 
Okay, we've got one good comment about hydrogen peroxide as a cheap and highly effective sterilization method. Yes, that would definitely be one of those good chemical options for uh, for sterilization. So thanks for, for adding that. So let's talk about um, some of the different system options. Uh, a floating raft system is one that um, where the roots are left continuously saturated in water. So this is a situation where we really don't utilize one of those growing media that we just talked about. So we would maybe start the seedlings in a soilless media like that cocoa, um, that cocoa pith, or we could start it in a rock wool plug. But then from there, we're really moving away from media and just transplanting directly into, in the case on, on the right here, um, we just would put that plug directly into uh, this foam board and then from there our roots are just um, submerged in a water solution. Now when roots are constantly submerged in water uh, some key components are that we get root aeration. Um, roots need oxygen levels uh, somewhere north of about 12 percent um, which they would typically find in soil unless it's fully saturated and if we don't provide aeration in that water solution sometimes those oxygen levels will drop below that critical threshold and we'll start to see some transition to anaerobic respiration uh, which becomes a real problem for the plant and it's also going to contribute to certain diseases. We also want to make sure that uh, we avoid uh, light penetration into that nutrient solution um, because that's going to contribute to algae growth and that algae will compete um, with our crop for for uh, oxygen in the water and also nutrients. And then we're also going to need some type of plant support. So I mentioned that these foam insulation boards are really the most common that I've seen, but there are, are other options. And this system is very popular with aquaponics, uh, which I'll, I'll mention briefly here in a bit. So these are relatively inexpensive systems, which is uh, why they're um, quite popular. Um, maintenance is much lower than some of the other systems I'll talk about. You can also utilize a, a raft system, um, or excuse me, you can utilize um, a bed system where you can move rafts around uh, the bed like we saw in this previous image. Uh, you might be able to use some type of uh, hook to move mature plants from one side of the greenhouse bay to the other, uh, and you could um, you could concentrate different planting and harvesting um, and IPM operations at different places throughout that growing bed. The drawback, of course, is that when roots are constantly submerged, uh, we do have to more intensively manage those root diseases like Pythium. Another popular option are aeroponic systems, where our nutrient solution is supplied um, via a mist, a continuous mist on the roots. Um, so these originally started out as, um, the, and they're still used um, in plant physiology studies, so there, there's a lot of homemade type aeroponic systems uh, in research labs around the world. Uh, but they had been less common commercially, uh, in part because um, there is a certain uh, energy requirement um, when you're constantly running that pump and running that pump high enough to create that fine mist. Um, but aeroponic systems have become more popular because of these tower systems. So I'm sure some of you have uh, flown through um, the O'Hare Airport in Chicago, and if you ever go to the G-Con course um, into the the second floor of that rotunda space there, you'll see this is not the vertical, it is actually on the first um, slide of my presentation. That title slide is a picture of that particular garden, but this is a similar garden um, where you get a similar type of uh, aeroponic um, system that um, provides nutrient solution to these vertical crops. So water is pumped to the top of these towers, and then you get uh, a misting, or in some cases you get a cascading mist um, down each of these individual towers. The benefit of an aeroponic system, um, some advantages compared to a floating raft system, is that we get uh, very high oxygen levels in that root zone because you don't have continuous submersion of the roots, so disease is not definitely not as much of a problem. Uh, in some cases, we can actually grow root crops because of the fact that we're not continuously submerged. So there is, um, in 
the seed potato industry. These aeroponic systems are commonly used to grow seed potatoes and then uh, some medicinal roots. Um, there's some evidence in the literature that medicinal roots are, are grown in aeroponic systems. And as I mentioned, the, the big drawback that I can see is that it is much more energy intensive because you need a higher powered pump that's running continuously. And you're also very um, susceptible to uh, an energy shutdown. So if you lost power for some reason and you didn't get that mist to those roots, uh, they're going to start to dry out pretty quickly in the absence of any type of media that retains moisture. Uh, a popular method of hydroponics that's been around for quite some time is the nutrient film technique. Um, this is uh, somewhat like the floating raft system, except the roots are not uh, con are, are not completely submerged in water. So about 10% of that root surface area um, near the bottom of the roots is submerged, but a large portion of the roots are are not. Um, and so a nutrient solution from your reservoir pumps to the top um, of your uh, grow bed, and there's a little you need to have somewhat of a of a decline in your growing bed and that will return that nutrient solution back to the reservoir into a, a closed loop recirculating system. You can also, there's a lot of conceptual designs of these cascading vertical systems where a nutrient solution is pumped to the top and then cascades down into your nutrient reservoir. So nutrient film technique uh, is most common for greenhouse lettuce production. Um, these types of small um, gutter systems uh, are very uh, effective for growing uh, quick 30 to 40 day lettuce crops. Um, the benefit of NFT is compared to say that floating raft system is you get great oxygenation of the roots. Um, these can be constructed from, there are prefabricated systems like you see in these two pictures, but this is something that you could easily construct um, with a trip to the Home Depot. You can buy some some home gutters and some tubing. Um, some PVC pipe and you could uh, put one together on your own uh, pretty inexpensively. Uh, I mentioned that this is very common for lettuce and some of those short season crops because of the fact that in these shallow channels um, the root mass starts to fill up that uh, that area pretty quickly and when that happens these troughs will will get clogged and so as the water gets pumped to the top and is expected to drain towards the bottom of this um, channel if you have a really high uh, root mass in there, it'll block the water. So one, you may not get even distribution of that nutrient sl uh, solution through the channel, but it's also going to raise the overall water level and decrease the oxygen level. So we're losing the benefit of the NFT system compared to complete, um, complete submersion of the roots in that floating raft system. So that's why it's most common for your short season lettuce and herb crops like basil. Uh, but there are systems um, where they will develop a deeper channel, a wider channel, that could be more compatible with your fruiting crops like tomato or cucumber. Ebb and flow systems, you can find plenty of ebb and flow systems, um, like your um, at-home garden systems, there's a lot of options for ebb and flow. Um, this is just a sub-irrigation uh, type of system where you would put your plants in a soilless media, and then set them in type inside of a um, grow tray and then set it on a timer so that your nutrient reservoir would flood this grow tray um, on some type of regular interval and that is how you deliver your nutrients and water um, through the bottom of those pots. This is most common um, and is still commonly used for ornamental greenhouse um, plant production, um, less common for food crops um, and it takes a, a, a unique type of greenhouse table and uh, trays to accomplish the, the drainage that's necessary um, for to make these systems um, work well. So these are popular for the potted ornamental plants because you can eliminate over-the-top uh, irrigation and fertigation so you're not left with salt spots on ornamental plants. Um, another benefit is that roots are well oxygenated um, because you get those long periods of um, of drainage or the ebb period. The drawback is that depending on growth stage, um, the plants can become stressed um, if we're not uh, keeping up with the um, evapotranspiration needs of the crop. And the frequency and duration of flooding depends on growing media and crop. 
So a very popular uh, method of, of hydroponic production are these soilless culture systems or these open systems with drip irrigation and emitters. Um, so in these types of systems, we just need a grow bag or a, a Dutch bucket or Beto bucket, these plastic um, pails. And we deliver the irrigation and um, nutrient solution to each of these individual pots uh, or pails through that um, that type of um, fertigation system that I showed earlier in the presentation with the um, with the two different uh, nutrient reservoirs. And there's a big emphasis on recirculating closed loop systems to reduce environmental impact. Um, but these open systems uh, can arguably be just as effective depending on how they're managed. Uh, if they're managed so that uh, you're not leaching more than 10 to 15 percent of your overall nutrient solution from the bottom of the pots, uh, which is what we would recommend, then if you consider how often you would need to discard your uh, total nutrient solution even in a closed loop system to minimize um, the buildup of diseases or to uh, adjust your nutrient uh, strength, then these could arguably be just as environmentally friendly as a closed loop system. Okay, and the last system I'll talk about is uh, aquaponics, and this is really popular amongst some of the stakeholders that I have in Chicago. Um, this is the integration of, of hydroponic production that we just talked about, but instead of using uh, the inorganic nutrients or uh, even organic nutrients, we're utilizing effluent uh, from an aquaculture fish system as uh, fertilizer for the plants. And uh, the thing I'll point out is that aquaponic systems do require intensive aquaculture production. And that's probably the biggest mistake that a lot of um, beginning growers make is that um, they're basically vegetable growers that want to get some inexpensive fertilizer, so they think they'll start raising fish. But in reality, it should be the other way around. Um, that typically aquaponic systems were first developed as filtration systems for aquaculture, intensive aquaculture production. And so you really do need uh, to have a high stocking density, intensive production of those fish to get the nutrient levels high enough uh, to a point where you can grow vegetable crops um, well. So the overall concept behind these systems is that fish uh, excrete ammonia and then plants um, need that to be converted um, to nitrate. So you've got nitrifying bacteria in the, solu in the nutrient solution um, that can help to uh, convert that and give you the, um, the correct nutrient um, proportions that you need. Now, which actual hydroponic system you grow in in an aquaponic system varies. As I mentioned, floating raft systems are quite popular um, because you get um, some nitrification on the bottoms of your foam boards. Um, so when we think about nitrification, we need to think about habitat for bacteria, because it's the bacteria that are responsible for that conversion process. A soilless media system, continuous flow or ebb and flow, um, those are helpful for thinking about biofiltration uh, and providing habitat. Gravel beds, like you see here, there's an organization called Growing Power based out of Milwaukee, and now they, um, or they're prevalent in Chicago as well, and they use these um, they do use some of these gravel bed systems where they'll grow things like watercress um, in their grow beds above uh, their um, their fish production systems. And you could use an NFT system um, to in an aquaponic system, but that would require a biofilter. Uh, and a biofilter may be a 55-gallon drum filled with perlite or sand, something that the water passes through that's stocked with those um, bacteria so that you get a high surface area and a lot of that nitrification to make sure that you get plenty of nitrogen to your plants. So just an example of, of kind of a commercial uh, operation that uses this aquaponics model is farmed here in Chicago. So they're utilizing um, a previously abandoned warehouse, utilizing five or six stacks high um, all the way up to the ceiling, growing things like basil, arugula, and other um, lettuce greens. And you can see they've got their um, intensive aquaculture fish tanks that they're then pumping into these grow beds in what appears to be a floating raft type of system. Okay, and I'll uh, finish up the webinar here today uh, before we open it up for questions, just to highlight some of the research that we've been doing. Um, so we're really um, diving in um, 
intensively this summer into looking at these vertigro systems. So vertigro is a popular hydroponic system that allows um, growers to um, to grow vertically and stack their uh, hydroponic pots, and that's somewhat feasible because of uh, using hydroponic media, which is lower weight, so we don't um, have the mass of soil in here weighing these things down. But the overall concept, um, we're going to be growing these strawberries hydroponically in high tunnel greenhouses, and the concept here is that we want to maximize every cubic foot of this entire um, valuable high tunnel growing space. And so instead of growing strawberries, for example, in matted rows, uh, by growing vertically and getting up to 3,200 plants in a 30 by 96 foot high tunnel, um, depending on the going market, market rate for strawberries in your particular area, uh, we were assuming um, 350 at the peak of the season, we could um, potentially expand the overall um, economic output of our tunnel to somewhere north of $15,000 per year. So what we'll be doing in this research is looking at a few different cultivars. So we're looking at Albion, San Andreas, Chandler, and uh, we'll be looking also at Seascape. And we want to see which of those cultivars is going to produce the highest quality and quantity of fruit. We're looking at uh, different media. So we're looking at cocoa coir, perlite, vermiculite as potential media. And then, as I mentioned, we'll be comparing those inorganic fertilizers that are uh, most commonly used in hydroponics, but because so many uh, folks are interested in the potential for at least um, at least a conceptually organic system, whether or not it can be certified by the USDA is another question, but the idea of using uh, you know, renewable or organic um, nutrient sources uh, in a, combined with a pesticide-free type of operation. So we'll be looking at that uh, in this high tunnel strawberry production system. Some other research that we just uh, finished up was we were looking at the question about whether or not uh, trying to identify which crops um, are uh, going to grow best in different types of systems. Uh, specifically, we were looking at um, an ebb and flow type system comparing uh, hydroponic production with aquaponic production. And the problem that our aquaponic stakeholders have is that um, it's hard to get, as I mentioned, that fish production to a, a level that's intensive enough that you'll provide ideal concentrations of nutrients into that solution. And so what we typically find when we take uh, water analyses from some of these aquaponic operations, one of those analyses is right here. This is what we took from um, a, uh, an operation um, in Milwaukee a couple of years ago. And you can see that if you compare the the nutrient concentrations from this analysis with more ideal hydroponic levels like you might see in uh, in Hoagland's solution, we're somewhere between about 5 to 40 percent dilute in aquaponics than we are in hydroponics. So, but we knew that there are a lot of aquaponic growers out there utilizing these low intensity systems and they're growing certain crops with a decent amount of success. So we wanted to ask the question, well, which crops um, are ideal for aquaponics and where should we, if we're going to grow hydroponically, which crops should we focus on growing hydroponically? So we looked at kale, tomatoes, pepper, and uh, basil, which you can kind of see in the picture here. And like I said, we knew that the plants can definitely survive, and we've got a randomized uh, treatment um, structure in here with both hydroponic full-strength nutrient solution and a one-quarter strength, so 25% aquaponic solution. And you can see that it's difficult when you just look at these two tables to identify differences in treatments because the plants are definitely growing, they're surviving, they're green. Um, just a real quick glance, everything looks great. But if you put these treatments side by side, like we did in this pepper experiment, you can see the, the growth is definitely stunted in that dilute nutrient solution compared to that full strength hydroponic solution. And so a lot of advocates of, uh, and researchers on aquaponics suggest that most of the, the profit, maybe not necessarily the total revenue, but most of the profit in an aquaponic system is in vegetables. So I would argue that it's um, maybe not wise to to invest in a crop that is going to be as stunted as, as those are in this picture, if that's where most of your profit is. So uh, in our research, um, just looking at fresh market yield um, in these particular systems for basil, kale, pepper, and tomato, we found that uh, 
we got the most production out of kale in a hydroponic solution, about uh, three times as much, or rather four times as much uh, yield in hydroponics compared to that dilute aquaponic solution. Basil was about a two-fold difference, whereas peppers and tomatoes, um, those fruiting crops, did okay in the aquaponic solution compared to hydroponics. We, there wasn't as much of a yield penalty by going into that more dilute aquaponics solution. So when you try to attach uh, some type of economic value to these crops um, based on basically grocery store prices or farmer's market prices, um, $15 a pound for basil if you can find somebody that wants that much basil, $3 a pound for kale, 3 for cherry tomatoes, which is what we were growing, and then $6 a pound for chipotle peppers, you can see that uh, obviously at $15 a pound, it's not no surprise that basil is going to be a very profitable crop and more so in hydroponics than in aquaponics. Same goes for kale, uh, but again, not much difference between pepper and tomato. So, so the results of our study suggest that, um, that for growing something like basil or kale, you want to go with more of that high nutrient strength solution um, to maximize profitability. But those fruiting crops, um, it may be okay to, um, to go in more of an aquaponic system. And then we also looked at overall quality. Obviously, as you reduce the amount of nitrogen in your solution, um, you might have some problems with uh, greenness or chlorophyll content, and we did see that in all four of our crops, that we did see some um, chlorosis in the leaves of those plants. So I'm going to stop there. We're right at about an hour, which is about the where I wanted to stop, and if um, if we have time for any questions or discussion, I'd be happy to uh, to moderate that now. Exactly. Okay, so yeah, Zach asked about uh, any figures or resources for startup costs in these operations. I don't have any of that information, Zach. Um, it, it's just so variable depending on the particular system, um, not only which hydroponic system you use, but whether you're going to grow in a completely controlled environment in a, in a greenhouse or whether you're going to go in a high tunnel, um, or I even showed you some of those systems that were completely outdoors. Um, and the other problem with trying to calculate these startup costs is that um, most of the available resources are based on some of the prefabricated kind of at-home basement type systems, uh, which are really expensive. Those, you know, for maybe 10 to 20 square feet of growing area, you're talking somewhere between 500 to 1,000 dollars for a prefabricated system, which isn't realistic. Isn't a realistic cost if you're going to grow on more of a commercial scale. Um, and so in those cases, you kind of have to get a more of a commercial quote from somebody like uh, Crop King, for example, or Farm Tech, uh, where you can find some of these supplies. So, um, so unfortunately, I don't have that information. Uh, Carrie has a good question about have we compared bricks numbers and produce? Um, we have. I, I couldn't uh, share that data because we just finished collecting it in the second round of that experiment that I talked about. Um, in the hydroponics versus aquaponics, um, and so that uh, that information will be forthcoming. But there's definitely um, some concern. A lot of consumers um, uh, perceive taste differences between food that's grown hydroponically or soil-based, um, and so bricks is uh, definitely one aspect that we want to look at for uh, overall quality of the produce. Um, to see if we're losing some quality uh, in a in a hydroponic or aquaponic system. So, unfortunately, I don't have those numbers for you either. Um, can you use fish emulsion instead of raising fish, uh, or would it be too costly? Um, that's a good question. It's a little bit of a different um, type of system. So the the benefit of aquaponics and raising the fish is that they provide a continuous supply of of nutrients. Um, so basically, as you feed the fish, and as they convert that uh, fish into biomass and they excrete some of it, um, you're slowly building up those concentrations in the water, uh, whereas fish emulsion is kind of the same, the same paradigm as adding mineral fertilizers in that you add it, it gets used up, and you have to add more. Um, and it's also different in terms of fish emulsion is, um, uh, is going to be more than just the fish waste. Um, Whereas in an aquaponic system, we're just really tapping into um, what's excreted, and so that's um, going to be very high in ammonia. Um, 
And fish emulsion, as you mentioned, it is costly. Um, we've used some of that, um, but it starts to break the bank pretty quickly if you rely only on, if you rely solely on fish emulsion to meet your uh, fertility needs in, in a hydroponic system. And Donna has a question about uh, a listing of types of crops that are best for the different types of hydroponic systems. Yes, um, the let me see if I can find the website quick, Donna. It is. A uh, website that has been maintained by Howard Resch, as I mentioned, that is the um, kind of the golden textbook for hydroponic production, and and there is some discussion in there of optimum crops for different uh, different systems in that textbook. Uh, but there's also a great website, and okay, easy enough. It's just Howard. Is it Howard Resch? HowardResch.com. So the book is going to be the best. Um, your best resource there, but this his website howardresh.com is a pretty good, um, at least provides a little bit of information about some different systems and some good crops to grow in those systems, and uh, if that piques your interest, then you might be compelled to to purchase the textbook. Uh, Zach's following up on Carrie's question about um, previous research. Are there differences in bricks and flavor profiles? There def there is some previous research to show. Um, differences in flavor profiles for sure between uh, hydroponics and aquaponics and soil based systems um, and quantif uh, I guess biochemically quantifying those flavor profiles um, is a little bit more challenging but there's been plenty of survey work um, and sensory tests and surveys uh, to demonstrate that consumers can uh, in blind taste tests distinguish a difference Hey, Sam, just in case we don't, you know, I, we have some people online that don't understand the BRICS. Can you give us a 30-second overview of BRICS and, and what people are getting at here? Yeah, so BRICS is just a measure of soluble solids in um, plant material. Usually we're interested in the fruit. Um, and soluble solids, most of the soluble solids that we're looking at is sucrose. Uh, so it's really a measure of the sugar content of of a fruit, for example, which is kind of used as a proxy for overall, uh, often used as a proxy for overall quality um, of the fruit. It's definitely not the end-all, be-all of, of quality, um, but it's the most commonly used indicator of, of quality in, um, in fruit and vegetable production. And, and Sam, can you talk a little bit, we've got a lot of small farm local food growers on here, probably all very um, uh, used to field-based growing or, or getting more experience every year as they go along here. Do you have some suggestions if they wanted to begin experimenting, what, what sort of system would be there, the, the best one for a novice to get into? Yeah, I think the, uh, the nutrient film technique, starting out growing uh, lettuce, in a nutrient film technique gutter based uh, channel system is um, probably going to be the best place to start um, I like those systems um, one because it's you know a quick quick turnaround you can have go from seeding to harvest in 30 to 45 days um, at the same time you you also don't have as much invested in each individual crop um, whereas if, you, if you're going with something like a tomato or a cucumber um, you invest a lot in each one of those individual plants, and so if you um, make a mistake as kind of a, a beginner hydroponic grower, um, say 60 days after you plant and you lose an entire crop, um, that's a little bit more devastating than uh, if 10 or 15 days into your lettuce crop you realize you made a mistake with um, your nutrient solution and you can quickly replant and um, still harvest 30 or 45 days later. So. That would be um, what I would say would be the best place to start. And in terms of just managing your nutrient solution, uh, I found that there's more margin for error in growing leafy crops uh, than growing those fruiting crops. Um, primarily because you know even in, even in soil-based systems, the the quality of a crop can be very uh, of a of a fruiting crop can be very sensitive. You know, struggling with things like blossom end rot, for example, in soil. Um, that is can be a really big problem in hydroponic systems, and so um, with our strawberry production systems last summer, we were growing um, ever-bearing strawberries, and so we had time to try and fine-tune the system throughout the entire year, um, and it just seemed like with every harvest, it was a different problem. You know, we started out with some calcium problems, so overall fruit quality was was lacking, so we adjusted calcium up. 
But then we started seeing some different deficiencies in the leaves, so we tried to adjust that, and it's just a lot, uh, a lot more trial and error with those fruiting crops. Um, and uh, of the crops that I've worked with, <laughs> I would say strawberry is the most difficult. Um, and that's probably true even in the field environment, but for sure in hydroponics, um, that is, um, can be a, diff a challenging crop to grow and grow well, a uh, high quality product. So that would be the last crop that I would recommend. So I'm going to stop there.